Beyond the, he- Beyond the Headlines. This is World Insight. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. This National Day holiday, a pivotal period for domestic consumption, marks a time when millions of Chinese people travel, shop, and celebrate, providing a powerful boost to various sectors. Chinese visitors' outbound travel bookings for the National Day holidays have spanned 1,597 cities in 144 countries and regions. The holiday has also sparked a significant rise in tourism across China with popular destinations experiencing a surge in visitors. For example, more than 980,000 Chinese mainland visitors arrived in Hong Kong between October the 1st and October the 5th, up 35% from the same period last year, boosting local businesses. In the entertainment sector, National Day box office hit a major milestone, already surging to over 2 billion yuan as of October the 7th. From retail to tourism, transportation to entertainment, the Golden Week is more than just a holiday. It's a key economic driver. For deeper insights, let's loop in our panelists. Joining us in Beijing, Li Yong, Chief Researcher at DNC Think Tank. Also, Inner Tangen, Senior Fellow at the Taihe Institute and Chairman of Asia Narratives. Welcome to both of you. How is your National Day holidays? Are you enjoying yourself? I didn't travel. I, I tend to be a little bit afraid of traveling given the uh, heavy uh, train schedules and airlines and things like this. But I did contribute to the economy. I th- think I went out every <laughs> single night for dinner and I had a few lunches <laughs> with friends. Uh-huh. Uh, so I was supporting the local economy and <laughs> just Beijing. enjoying <laughs> uh, Beijing and also the weather here. I mean, it's nice. As long as I didn't go near Tiananmen Square, it was a wonderful, easy, traffic yes, indeed. <laughs> city. What about for you, Mr. Yeah. Lee? Yeah, I was trying, uh, I have been trying to stay from, stay away from the crowd, but at the same time, you know, I had uh, a couple of get-togethers with friends, you know, had a lot of drinks, you know, eat a lot of foods. And of course, I also checked out the uh, trading programs because, you know, I have a couple of uh, home licenses that I, I wish uh, to replace, um, you know, probably this is going to happen in the next couple of weeks. We understand at the end of uh, September, right before the National Holiday, there were some kinds of stimulus packages coming out. Uh, for example, uh, interest rates here in China, liquidity is more into the market. You also see the easing of uh, real estate policies uh, in some regions of China. All of this can be contributing to the uh, consumption enthusiasm among average consumers. But how much, Mr. Tengen? Already, it's very positive. Uh, people have been looking at stocks, obviously, you know, a huge rebound uh, uh, overseas in reaction to China. Uh, you've seen a lot of movement, uh, but the stock market has been extremely robust. And this mm-hmm. is really helping. Already, there are reports about increased activity in the housing markets, uh, especially in major cities, um, because of the relaxation. So there's a lot of pent-up demand. One issue, though, is that the economy isn't perhaps as ready (laughs) as it was because a lot of people had gone home. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there there weren't even people to cut hair and uh, do nails and things like that when people wanted to celebrate. How much do you see enthusiasm has been somewhat boosted as a result of the latest uh, combination of policies, Mr. Lee? Well, you can see during the holidays, you can see reports from different places that, uh, you know, the confidence in the property market has incre- increased and, uh, you know, the home buyers are, um, you know, are, uh, are trying to, you know, to look for a new apartment, for example, and uh, they don't really seem to have uh, the uh, past concerns about the uh home deliveries, and that as the result of the uh, Politburo meet, uh, meeting. And uh, the, you know, the, in terms of the property market, I think you know, we, are, we have seen uh, the uh, trend to reverse the decline, and uh, it is going towards stability. And of course, in terms of consumption, as, uh, as we, we can all know that um, you know, the travel during the national holiday 
uh, is going to bring about an uh, increase in the consumption uh, across the board. Yeah, we, we see some new trends uh, that we have noticed over the past few years, uh, even about uh, uh, tourism. For example, uh, more people are traveling across the region and many more are traveling in their neighborhood. Uh, for example, within three hours fast train ride. That is very unique a phenomenon in the uh, local traveling within China. You also see a new trends of young people traveling, what they call special forces travel uh, uh, patterns, meaning they try to bring in as many patterns of consumption as possible that can save them their budgets. Um, you see them uh, taking the slow train overnight in order to save uh, for the hotel fare. You also see them living in, um, you know, inside the city center um, uh, youth hotels, which are cheap, but manage to get to any place very conveniently. And you also see they're trying to take advantage of all the policies. Uh, preferential policies to encourage consumption, uh, especially for tourists in different parts of China. Meanwhile, there's another trend of people going to small towns in China, which did not charge you uh, a skyrocketing uh, hotel fare, and yet you can relax, have a quite decent food and also boarding. So that is also a new trend, the small town tourism. So. Uh, you know, at a time when the economy is yet on its uh, fullest steam to recover, how do you see these new trends in Chinese uh, consu among Chinese consumers? What does it say about uh, you know the nature of consumption these days, and how uh, likely uh, the demands will be created uh, if you look at the current situation, Mr. Li? Well, I think there are two, uh, three key words. Uh, one is differentiation. You know, different local localities they are trying to differentiate their travel products or the all cultural tourism products, and uh, each of the uh, locations you know they are trying uh, to have differentiated strategies, uh, differentiated products. The other key word is diversification, and they uh, produce diversified programs you know, just to meet individualized uh, need or demand. So the, sec the third keyword is individualization. And based because of the above three keywords or the key measures that different localities you know, adopted, so we can see a trend that is called travel dupes, meaning that uh, you know, because of diversification, individualized programs, and differentiated programs, you know, the uh, travelers can choose to less visited or less uh, traveled places, you know, to meet their individual you know, demands or individual cultural uh, demands. And e the same is even true with outbound travels. During the National Day holiday, there is China Open going on, the tennis game. And we see a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, particularly with Queen Wen, which is a leading uh, female player, also participating in that game. Uh, there is a full house all the time, even when the game is reaching late into the night. So that is another thing people are looking at today, not only culture, but also sports, not only tennis, but also table tennis championship taking place at the same time of the National Day holiday. All of these are, you know, interesting stories going on that you see are having a great impact on consumers and how, and also the other way around uh, to analyze uh, where Chinese consumers are and what do they really like. Mr. Tangan. Yeah, this goes back to authentic experiences. Also, you know, the Olympics ignited uh, interest uh, in tennis, which had already been high. Yeah. Uh, they re re you know, the Chinese people really looked at how their athletes performed both on uh, the, uh, the mm -hmm. field and, and off, more importantly. And, you know, what you see is 
people are more interested now yeah. in understanding more about China. And this is setting a new pattern. Uh, local businesses, I guarantee you, will do better. And mm -hmm. this is really important for an economy, which right. you know, 90 percent of new jobs are created by small, medium sized business entities, 80 percent mm -hmm. of existing jobs. So really important in resetting the trend of uh, China's new confidence. Now, do you see the need, given what you are witnessing today, during the National Day holiday of Chinese consumption and also consumers' power, a need for a huge stimulus package. Uh, how do you see this unique experience during the National Day holiday will be linked to all the other future policies coming from China in order to promote its economic growth? Mr. Tengen. Yeah, I, I think something needs to be done because the issue here is confidence. Uh, if you start looking at savings, it's at record levels, uh, but people are uncertain about the economy. Mm -hmm. As we've seen from the market reaction to this, this is instilling uh, a lot of confidence, but there it has to be supported. Um, but China's path is not one of just throwing money into the winds. Uh, they're being very uh, careful, very targeted. They want to make sure that the investments that are made in, in infrastructure, etc., actually have a payback to them. Mm -hmm. And this is what is really important. So people, um, you know, from my side, uh, from the economics side, are, are looking about how they're specifically going to support a lot of these programs and how targeted they're going to be. Mr. Lee? You know, tomorrow's press conference is going to provide guidance and detailed uh, explanation about the policies and possible suggestions with regard uh, in with regard to what direction we are supposed to go, and uh, that I think is going to be very important uh, for the rest of the year to achieve the the GDP goals, uh, economic development, and social development goals. Three more months to go. Uh, we see the target being set earlier this year, and we'll see what policies are likely to follow in order to encourage more confidence among Chinese consumers to promote the economy. Thank you so much uh, for both of you uh, for joining us uh, today on this important topic. And both Chinese and European sides have voiced the serious concerns and dissatisfactions following the European Union's decision to adopt the definitive tariffs of up to 45% percent on Chinese electronic vehicle imports in the vote taken last Friday. China's Ministry of Commerce said last Friday that China firmly opposes the unfair, illegal and unreasonable protectionist practices of the EU and the EU's move will not solve any problem but only weaken the confidence of Chinese companies wanting to invest in and collaborate with EU partners. On the European side, in the wake of Chancellor Olaf Scholz call for continuing negotiations with China. Germany's finance minister indicated on social media that tariffs on Chinese electronic cars will be wrong and trade wars only have losers. Echoing these concerns, Hungary voted against the imposition and Hungarian prime minister also warned against an economic Cold War. German automaker giant BMW, for example, warned of negative consequences, saying the vote is a fatal signal for the European automotive industry. For deeper insights, let's loop in our panelists for a discussion between China and Europe. Joining us in Budapest, Chaba Wolf, Vice President of China Cham with the Hungarian Chinese Chamber of Economy. Joining us in Beijing, Li Yong, Chief Researcher at the DNC Think Tank. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Your first yeah. response to the decision being made by the EU regarding definitive tariffs against China-made electronic vehicles. Mr. Wolf. Yeah, um, the, the EU countries actually have very diverse opinion on this issue, but uh, uh, most probably these tariffs will be worried. The, the, the two actually main, main opponents of, uh, of these tariffs are Germany and Hungary, both are for probably different reasons. Um, Hungary is, uh, is having a, a China-friendly policy. Um, there are a lot of uh, big Chinese investments in Hungary. And um, uh, Hungary's government's intention is definitely not to, to put any control on, on Chinese products or Chinese investments in, uh, in Europe. Mm. However, Germany has a, has a different uh, uh, approach to this issue. Mm. Uh, Germany has China as, as one, of, uh, one of its major uh, export markets. So Germany is probably uh, 
trying to avoid countermeasures taken by the Chinese government. BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, the, the big uh, OEMs in Germany, uh, they are actually exporting uh, a lot of cars to uh, China. So any kind of tariffs uh, against Chinese EV vehicles floating to Europe might affect the German exports to China, and probably that is why uh, Germany is not really agreeing mm. on these tariffs. We understand, Mr. Li, at this moment, on October the 7th today, the teams coming from China and the EU side are still in negotiation, hopefully with some further common ground can be achieved. Now, your understanding of the nature of this negotiation going on right now, how much ground is likely to be there, both sides can share. Any substantial da damages and the automakers are getting worried about this, you know, protectionist measure. You know, that will, uh, you know, that will, I think, uh, you know, uh, damage, you know, the kind of a, the free trade order. So that I think you know is you know it is the kind of complexity and in and also if we see you know the top three importers they didn't vote you know for the uh, tariff you know the oppositions are coming uh, from car manufacturers and if we look at the uh, share of imports you know by country you know the top three importers are Belgium, which you know import about 55 percent of all the uh, Chinese EVs. You know they didn't vote uh, for the tariff, and German voted against, and they ranked the, the second. Spain ranked the third. So you you know you, you can see the you know there are just the ten countries voted for, and none of them imported a great portion. Of Chinese EVs, mm. you know, as such, that will constitute, you know, so, some sort of, uh, um, you know, competitive uh, pressure. Uh, okay. Not to say, uh, you know, damages. With that, we seem to be uh, in a very interesting situation. And of course, you know, in terms of the vote, uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, there's in, there's any opportunities that we're going to reverse it. Mr. You know, Wolf, your thoughts on that, that, you know, possibilities <laughs> of negotiations? I believe that um, if the if, if the negotiations have a turn on, on, on not exactly tariffs on, on imports of uh, uh, electric vehicles, but uh, defining their qualities, defining their, uh, uh, their appearances, um, or, or defining the the labor force they have to use uh, in in Europe, uh, because uh, we have to know that uh, these these Chinese uh, electric car uh, vehicle manuf electric vehicle manufacturers they are actually investing in Europe, building up factories, uh, not only battery factories but also car factories, right. uh, producing uh, electric cars, and uh, and they are actually employing a lot of local people. They are paying a lot of local taxes, which is actually good for the. Uh, for the European economy, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention that um, if, uh, if if the EU uh, doesn't really use these tariffs against China, then China will not take uh, uh, countermeasures mm -hmm. uh, on the on the European uh, exports. Uh, it looks like that uh, battery technologies in China, EV technologies in China, uh, a little bit ahead of the uh, of Europe, a little bit ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, for the ones who who want to use the the most developed, uh, most most environmental friendly and uh, and cheapest technologies uh, with the with the least uh, footprint uh, on the environment uh, then probably it's uh, it's necessary to to actually include chinese products uh, it's it's necessary to cooperate with china on on technological issues not to mention that uh, the chinese um, manufacturers uh, both cars and and battery manufacturers they are they are like expanding in these years uh, and the upcoming years. Uh, they are growing their business. Uh, they are taking up new markets, not only in Europe, but but also in Southeast Asia and in, mm -hmm. in some other places. So their development is, is a kind of a, a available. Uh, uh, Europe will not stop them. Uh, with these tariffs, uh, it might be beneficial for, for, for a few uh, European manufacturers, but in general, uh, probably 
the the European uh, OEMs uh, mm. will, will suffer suffer disadvantages, and and that's why the the European opinions are, are so diverse now. Mm. On the other hand, Mr. Lee, what kind of precedence to you as a trade expert? This discussion between China and EU regarding electronic vehicles is likely to set for future discussions between the two sides about trade issues. You know, uh, from the beginning of the uh, countervailing investigation, and even today, you know, if we see the combination of votes, uh, it's kind of a you know interesting to observe that uh, majority of the country countries, um, you know, they uh, either abstained or objected, and only 10 countries, you know, voted again, uh, voted for uh, the tariff. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, we are in a very complicated situation, but at the same time, mm -hmm. we have to uh, realize, you know, what these composite complexities will bring about to, uh, you know, the earlier uh, questions about the uh, commitment of EU to fighting you know the burning issue of uh, of climate changes, and uh, I see obviously the impact uh, on the uh, uh, on the um, I think on the consumption of low carbon products, including EVs. We also noticed that both sides, uh, both China and the EU, have been trying to. Uh, suggest that they are on the side of the world trade rules. How do you see this debate or this discussion not only setting a precedence for China and the EU in terms of trade issues, but also to a certain extent set a precedence uh, for uh, international trading systems which is now going through quite a critical transition? First of all, um uh, I, I need to say that uh, the behind the EU decisions, um, there are also political reasons, not only not only clear economic reasons. So mm. some of the governments make political decisions uh, on that, who we make friends with, who we don't uh, make friends with. And uh, and the, the EU countries approach uh, towards China uh, is uh, is very two sided. On the other hand, in the EU, the government subsidies, uh, this is a this is a very strict regulation, and uh, none of the EU member countries are allowed uh, to to have any kind of government subsidies in their in their commercial investments. So some of the some of the Europeans believe that they are not competitive in price with the Chinese products because um, government subsidies in Europe are more strictly uh, controlled than they are controlled in China, and that is why. Uh, and that is why they are they are trying to reach to a point uh, when um, no government subsidies would be allowed on uh, on Chinese vehicles which enter the the European Union uh, market. Mm. I understand that, but on the other hand, with the punitive tariffs uh, being put on Chinese uh, made electronic vehicles, uh, one could also argue that is protectionist measures coming uh, from the EU side. Having said that, though, how do you see this very complex web of interests? Uh, to a certain extent, shall we? How should we understand the result of this discussion eventually vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is going to be the priority of the EU for the future? Uh, is it going to be industry, economy? Is it going to be politics vis-a-vis -vis, uh, businesses and trade? Is it going to be geopolitics as the priority and the priority only? Or is it going to be something else? You also have to know that, uh, that the, the EU member states uh, are are very very different countries. Industry is is always a, a strong voice in the European Union because uh, that is somehow uh, defines the living standard of the people and 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 industry and and eco economic mm, development yeah. and GDP growth. It, it, this is what drives the, uh, the 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 living standard of the people. So I believe that that this is always the most important issue. Yeah. However, political issues will always be there yeah. in this in this diverse uh, mm. uh, environment. Mm. So that would be that would be very difficult to make a, 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 a definite future for that. Well, basically, you know, we have started to see uh, two different um, EUs. One is the business EU, based on which uh, EU has been thriving, developing, and uh, has has been globalizing. 
And then the other part of the other side of EU is the politicians EU, and that I think it is is a little more political, or it, or or is trying to pol politicizing, you know, the economic and trade relations between China, mm. uh, particularly in terms of its alliance uh, with uh, with the United States. Thank you so much, uh, Li Yong and uh, Chaba Wolf. Appreciate it. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight. Check out our YouTube channel, follow us on X and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.